the Sermon on the Mount uh, that we have been going through for some time, the Sermon on the Mount is Christ's manifesto, as we say, on the kingdom of heaven. Here's something to consider. Every kingdom has laws. As a matter of fact, every kingdom must have laws. Now, when it comes to the law, specifically the Jewish people in Jesus' day, but the Jewish people from Jesus' day clear backwards in history to the time of the giving of the law, the Jewish people were a people who were defined by their law. Now, it wasn't really their law. It's God's law. It was given by God to and through those people called Israel, and that was to be a light to the Gentiles. In Jesus' manifest, uh, uh, manifesto uh, about his kingdom, he addresses the law, the law of Moses, the law of God, the law of Israel. Well, no kidding, of course he did. He's the king of the Jews. How could he not speak about the law? Now, in speaking about the law, hypothetically, key word, hypothetically, he could have, uh, he could have done any of three, say, options uh, about how to address the law. The first approach he could have had is he could have rejected the law altogether. And no doubt some would have liked, loved that. There are always those who want to get rid of the law. Who is that? Well, the lawless. Uh, but Jesus didn't do that. He didn't just reject the law. Uh, and, and he couldn't do that. Why? Well, because every kingdom must have laws. Why must there be laws in a kingdom? Because if there is no law, it's anarchy in a kingdom can't be an anarchy. It's got to be a monarchy. Uh, and second of all, Jesus couldn't have rejected the law altogether because God's law, as it was given to Moses, is holy and righteous and good. So he didn't come to reject the law. Uh, second approach, he could have replaced the law. He could have replaced the law. Well, because every kingdom must have laws, he couldn't have rejected it altogether, we've just said that, but hypothetically, he could have scrapped the law and then replaced it with something else. Actually, some think he did, Christians who kind of fall into the category of antinomianism, that is, people who are kind of dismiss the law of God, uh, they insist that there is no law for Christians anymore other than the law of love, which is really nice, but that's not what he did either. As a matter of fact, we know he didn't dismiss the law altogether. Because in verse 15, he specifically uh, talks about the law. Actually, actually, we want to go up a little bit. So verse 17, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So that's, that's very important. Here's a third approach he could have taken by, to address the law. He could have restated and revised it. He could have restated and revised the law. That's actually what the scribes and Pharisees had been, been doing for generations. They were adding to the law. They were taking their traditions about how to obey the law, and they were adding those to the law, uh, revising the law, and the sum total that what it accomplished, well, according to Jesus in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, he says, your traditions, the things that they added to the law, make void the law or the word of God. Jesus didn't come to do that either. Instead, instead of rejecting or replacing or restating and revising, here's what he did. Jesus refocused the people's attention and understanding of the law, fulfilling it. That's what he said. I didn't come to get rid of or destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And we said last time that Jesus fulfilled the law in a couple of ways. One, by obeying it perfectly, and he's the only one who ever has. And second, by being the priest and the sacrifice that all of the Old Testament ceremonial laws were pointing to, and he fulfilled all of those by being uh, that. And so that's how he fulfilled. However, I want to just draw your attention to another aspect of this word fulfill. The word fulfill can also mean complete. Jesus fulfilled the law. Listen carefully. He fulfilled the law here in the Sermon on the Mount by giving a complete understanding and intention of the law, by drawing people's attention not merely to the letter of the law, but to, more importantly, the spirit of the law, which is what God intended all along. 
which what God intended all along. For instance, and we're going to talk about these this week and, and next. Thou shalt not murder. Great, great. You never killed anybody. Congratulations. But do you love people? Do you love people? Or do you hate people, but you stop short of murdering, and therefore you're virtuous? Well, you're still guilty then. That's what Jesus is going to say. And then next week, we'll look at, at Jesus' treatment of the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. Great, you've never committed the act, but does your mind imagine and does your heart burn with lust, stopping short of actually committing the act of adultery? Uh, the act of adultery. Great, you're so virtuous, but in your heart, you're still guilty before God. Make no mistake about this. God does care about our actions. God does care about our actions, but, all, but God also sees and knows our hearts. And our hearts condemn us no less before God than do our actions. God cares about both. God cares about both. Every kingdom has laws. Every kingdom must have laws. And in this section of the sermon that we're just going into, Jesus tells us that the law of God is not set aside or destroyed or done away with by the coming of the king. The law still condemns sinners so that we may cry out to God for mercy. That's a great usage of the law. Secondly, the law still gives light to those who believe by instructing us how to live, how to live not to be saved, but because by God's grace we are saved. From verse 21 to verse 48 of uh, chapter 5, Jesus teaches us that the standard of the law, rather than being reduced by Christ, is actually raised. Uh, God's standard was never merely about external obedience to the law, but rather it was God's intention all along that we have a heartfelt understanding and obedience to his law. Jesus makes this clear with several examples. And the first one, which is what we'll deal with this time, is the relationship between hatred and murder. Unbridled anger, unrighteous anger and murder. So look at verse 21. Um, this is chapter 5, of course. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. And by the way, if you stop there, this is like on all the people who've never actually killed somebody are thinking, oh, good, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, we've heard that. You've heard that, verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother, and some translations add these words, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. The first thing I want you to note is Jesus' words, you have heard it said, and then, but I say to you. This is something that points out Jesus' authority. Jesus' authority. At the end of the sermon, the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, they were all marveling because he spoke as one with authority. And this is why. He says, you've heard it said, but I say. The religionists in his day, they bolstered their arguments by quoting famous rabbis and by citing precedents, even as attorneys and lawyers do in these days, by citing precedents. The Old Testament pro prophets, frequently they preface their remarks by saying, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. They have authority. So the Old Testament prophets, thus says the Lord. The, the scribes and Pharisees and religionists of Jesus' day, well, Rabbi so-and-so says, and there's a precedent here and a precedent there. Jesus comes along and he says, you know what? I say, I say, it's Jesus speaking. He's claiming authority and by taking uh, his words and comparing them to the words of the Old Testament prophets, thus says the Lord Jehovah, he says, but I say, he's also claiming deity. He's also saying, I, I am God, and I, this, is what I, this is what I say, and this is what I mean. Jesus then refers, as we just read, to the sixth commandment, 
thou shalt not murder. A couple of things about that that are interesting. First of all, murder is not in every way the same as killing, or maybe we should say killing is not in every way the same as murder. There are instances in which killing, in which taking a human life is not murder. If you, if you are defending yourself and the only way to stop someone from killing you is to kill them, that is not murder. War, taking a life in war. We can debate all day long whether a war is just or not just. That's not the point. But assuming it's a just war, taking a life in war is not murder. In our laws, we have things for unintentional manslaughter. You take a life and it wasn't intended. It was an accident. And then also the state executing those guilty of capital crimes. None of those instances, which are all killing, none of those instances are murder. And the law was about murder. The law was not saying that lives are never to be taken. The words about judgment in verse 21 and 22, he says, if you do these things, you're in danger of the judgment. Uh, those words about judgment are not only, although they are, but they're not only about the final judgment, but to judgment and execution at the hands of civil authorities. And we know this. Um, the civil authorities are tasked, we'll talk about this in a little bit, they're tasked with, with carrying out justice, including execution of those guilty of such penalties. But we know that this is what Jesus is talking about, because in verse 22, he says those who are guilty will be in danger of the council. In other words, of not only of God, but of civil authorities. There is a price to pay for it here. In verse 22, Jesus equates murder with anger. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And so he's talking about anger. Most murders, most murders are crimes of passion. Uh, and anger is at the heart of most murders. Someone is angry at someone and that anger is unbridled and it, and it turns into murder. Now, I say most murders, taking of life like that, uh, are because of passion, because of anger. Actually, what's, what's really kind of sad is that in this mixed up godless world in which we live today, there are more and more murders that are not necessarily fueled by anger. Um, how many people are killed because of stray bullets? That's a sad thing, no kidding. And then there are increasingly more people punctuated throughout history of people who just thrill, they just kill for the thrill, which is rather sick, of course. Verse 22, at least in the New King James here, it says, angry with his brother without cause. I want to comment on those two words there. The brother in this sense is, is not limited to a biological brother, it's not even limited to, uh, as it is in 1 John, speaking about uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, but rather this is speaking more of uh, people who are, as we're going to see in a few moments, people who, are who, like us, are created in the image of God, who are created in the image of God. And then the, uh, the phrase, without cause, this phrase is not in the oldest manuscripts. If you're reading it from the ESB or the NASB, you'll notice that that phrase is not there. That doesn't mean that it's uh, wrong. It just means it's not there. Uh, but one thing that it is, is it, a it is a reminder that in some cases, anger can be justified. God gets angry, and obviously he's justified in it. So if it's, uh, only for, if it's for justifiable causes, uh, anger is not always bad. We're told, be angry and sin not. There are things to be angry about, mainly injustice uh, or uh, sins against God. We should be angry for the sake of God's, uh, God's name. Verse 22 says, whoever says to his brother, Raka. Now, there's a phrase we don't use, right? Because it's not a part of our language. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. It helps us to know what this word raka means. It not only means fool, but it is a, a very uh, a harsh, slanderous way of calling a person 
a fool. The Bible refers to people as foolish. The Bible refers to things as um, uh, actions and what have you as foolish. But those are more in terms of identifying what is foolish. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Um, what Jesus is talking about here is apparently it was a, a, a common slanderous way of, of defaming a person and calling a person a fool in a, some might even say verbally murdering the person's character or his value as a person. And that's where this is obviously fueled by anger, not by saying, hey, that was a, not a, you know, I could say in counseling, you know, you've made some foolish decisions. That's not saying rock it to your brother. Um, this gets to uh, an important reason why murder is so heinous in the eyes of, of God. Um, and, and it tells us why the penalty for murder is so severe. The first time we hear about a penalty uh, and it being a penalty of life uh, is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. God tells Adam, quote, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For on the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now here, God isn't saying that another human being is going to execute you for this. God's saying, I'm going to. And uh, some people have argued, well, they didn't die on that day. Well, you know, there's ways of answering that. They died spiritually and they began to die. And then Genesis chapter 5, where not only was there a lot of begetting going on, but everybody dies. Everybody dies. This is repeated in a sense of disobeying God is a capital offense because Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. And that's not just speaking of physical death, which all of us will someday face unless we're alive when the Lord comes again, but rather it is the second death. It's that, it's that death at the hands of God, and uh, which is his wrath for eternity. So sinning against God is punishable by death. Now, if you look at the Old Testament law, you'll see a number of things. I, I'm sure that you would agree with this. A number of offenses in the Old Testament law that call for capital punishment, and we might go, yee, that's kind of strong for that. We wouldn't do that. We might consider it unduly harsh. Now, I'm not going to dive into that right now because that's not our, our point. The matter at hand is not the punishment of death, capital punishment for death, but the, the matter at hand is the offense of murder. And I just want to share a couple of thoughts about the offense of murder. If God says an offense is punishable by death, which he does say for murder, then that's the way it is. It doesn't matter whether we understand it. It doesn't matter whether we like it or not. And secondly, these ultimate penalties, even penalties for things we would think, well, that seems kind of harsh that a person would be executed for, for that offense. What it does provide is a peek into the heart of God. It tells us a little bit about what he thinks is the most serious. If we don't agree with God about things, about anything, but about things like that, at best we do not understand what is of ultimate importance, as God does, and at worst it means we think we're wiser than he is, or that we're more loving and compassionate than he is, which of course is foolish, and I'm not calling you Raka. Okay, I just want to make sure we get that. It's, I'm saying this descriptively. The clearest passage, the clearest passage on capital punishment taking a life because one has taken a life, is in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. This is God giving the law way before Moses. He's giving this law to Noah after the flood. And he says this, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Now clearly that's talking about capital punishment. And here, murder is that serious. Again, our point in bringing this up is not to try to decipher why certain crimes uh, call for capital punishment and why don't, why they don't, but is rather to say, why is murder so serious? 
Why is murder so serious? If you kill someone, if you shed man's blood by man, your blood shall be shed. It's a call for capital punishment. But, but why? And the rest of the verse answers the question unequivocally. For or because in the image of God, he, that is God, made man. The whole point here is that Man, it's a reminder that mankind, human beings, are created in the image of God. And because we are stamped with his image, there is something unique about the life of human beings that is not true of any other life on the planet. Let me just share four observations about this call for capital punishment, as we would call it today, for shedding another person's blood, for murder. First of all, shedding human blood is not the same as shedding animal blood. Cruelty to animals is obviously a sickness. It's wrong. But killing an animal is not murder. Killing an animal for food isn't even a crime. It's not even wrong. Killing animals, if, if I don't mind me saying this just sort of as an added thing, if we're really going to understand God's kindness and what have you. Killing animals merely for sport, I'm just saying this is me, seems a little sick. If it's for the sake of food, that makes sense because that's why we, God gave us animals. Some, you know, the joke is if God didn't want us to eat uh, animals, why did he make them out of meat? You know, So there's something there. Those that don't want to eat meat, fine, don't. No problem, no problem. Don't eat meat. But meat is a staple of and has been th throughout all of time, just about, since Noah, uh, has been a staple part of man's diet. And so it's not a crime. It's not murder. Secondly, shedding a man's blood is a reference to murder, not to justifiable homicide. Because later on, when God gives more laws, he talks about what to do in the case when someone accidentally takes a life. It's not murder. It's not a death penalty. Thirdly, the penalty for murder is capital punishment. You took a life in the sense of murder, you forfeit your life. By the way, as a little footnote to that, one thing that's fascinating, I'm not saying that we could replicate this, but it certainly does give us a, a picture of what's important to God. Do you realize in God's law, there's no really no incarceration? There's no crimes where you just warehouse people and incarcerate them. It's restitution. You pay back with huge interest. You don't just give back what you stole, but you have to give back what you stole with uh, varying huge interest rates or execution. It's restitution or execution. There's no incarceration. Think about that. Maybe that's why the uh, capital punishment or execution it was used more in that law. Here's the fourth thing. What's the reason? What's the reason for this? And this is all important. This is my reason for having us consider Genesis 9, 6. Human beings are created in the image of God. Human beings are created in the image of God. Listen, desecrating the image of God in human beings is as serious as desecrating the God in whose image human beings are created. I wish we understood that. This isn't just a crime against the person. It is that. But it's not just a crime against the person. It's not just a crime against society. It's not just a crime against the family of the person who was killed. It's a crime, a sin against God. Because human beings, human life, created in the image of God. And I would add just a footnote to that to say, and it doesn't matter how big or how well-developed or how small or how underdeveloped a human being is when you take the life of a human being and it's not for some justifiable reason, as, as we mentioned earlier. It's homicide. It's, it's in essence murder. And I tell you true, the United States of America, for any other sins that we're guilty of, we are guilty of no sin more than we're guilty of the sin of murdering millions of human beings created in the image of God while still in the wombs of their mothers. 
The United States of America has so much unrequited blood on our hands as a nation that I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like if the fury of God was unleashed on us. And it would be deserved. Murder is so serious to God because it desecrates the God, not only the image of God, but the God who is behind that image. Now, as society grew, it became understood that the execution of a murderer was to be done by governing authorities rather than by individual vigilantes. Um, blood vengeance is a very sort of brutal way of, of taking a life for having taken a life. And so as time has gone on, God has uh, enlightened man and ordained through his law that it's not up just to the individual to just go and get vengeance for the death of a friend or a loved one, but rather the governing authorities are to do this. Why is that important? Well, first of all, it removes the passion and the vengeance aspect because vengeance is God's. Most vigilantes and most people who want to go out there and, and, and get their, their blood vengeance, they're not thinking about justice. They may say they are, but they're not. They're thinking about anger and they're thinking about vengeance and their taking of that life could spiritually be just as wrong as the initial murderer because vengeance belongs to, the God, belongs to God. There's another reason why the execution of murderers is to be done by the governing authorities and not by individual vigilantes. It slows the process down so that we can actually verify guilt rather than fueling vengeful, vengeful bloodlust. There's, there's reasons in a civilized society that there needs to be a process of establishing guilt rather than you killed my brother, I'm going to kill you, and boom, it's done. And then how many times do you find out, oh, it's not what I thought it was? Oops. That's why the law needs to be involved, and that's why it's, it's God's plan. It slows down, it removes the vengeance, and it verifies the guilt. Romans chapter 13, God gives the governing authorities the sword, it says. He doesn't give the sword to individuals to go out and execute blood vengeance but rather the authorities. And the authorities are responsible to God for how they use that sword in terms of executing people who are guilty. And again, our comments today are primarily about murder, to punish them. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 13, God says that the authorities are ordained by God to punish evildoers and to reward those who do good. And I've said for many years, how does, how is, what is the simplest way that that happens? Punishing evildoers is the reward for those who do good because it rewards them with a sense of safety and a sense of peace and protection that evildoers are being stopped. We might ask the question, what happens to a society when the government fails to do this? when they fail to, to deal with evil, evildoers as they're supposed to, well, what that does is that strips the reward given to those who are lawful. There, there's no longer a sense of safety and protection because the authorities are not doing their job. Deuteronomy chapter 21 is an interesting passage there, and I don't want to get sidetracked on what usually grabs our attention in that passage, but in that passage, it talks about if parents have a rebellious child, a child who is, who is just incorrigibly, incorrigibly rebellious, and it, and it says that they are to take the child, not out back and cut his throat, but they're to take him to the authorities, and if the authorities can't get this child to turn himself around to be respectful and honor his parents, the child is to be executed. Now, we, we cringe at that, and I'm glad that that's not the case. I wouldn't be standing here because I can't speak for you. Maybe you were all perfectly honoring your parents, but I know I didn't always. I dishonored my parents by being a rebellious child, a rebellious teenager. 
I'm glad I wasn't executed for it. Now, the reason for bringing this passage up is not to discuss whether or not it's just for execution of a rebellious child. The reason for bringing it up is because in that text in Deuteronomy chapter 21, 18 through 21, it says, and so you shall put this evil away from among you. What is that referring to? Very simply, it's a deterrent. I heard a great preacher one time teach this passage and say, little boy comes over and knocks on the door. Is, is Jimmy home? Can Jimmy come out and play? And his parents kind of look at the kid's playmate and said, oh, you didn't hear. Uh, you hear what? Jimmy's dead. What? Yes, he was rebellious so much that we took him to the elders of the city and they agreed and he's now dead. Now, what is that going to do to other kids who are being rebellious to their parents? It's kind of a reminder, maybe you shouldn't. God is saying that the death penalty is a deterrent. It doesn't matter that all the sociologists in the world say it's not. God's word says it is. If nothing else, it means that that same person won't commit that same crime again, but it also it has a deterring effect on the people around them to say, oh, no, we, we don't want to do that because they, they execute people for that. That's, that's a serious, serious thing. Again, why, why do some people, modern people who think they know better than God, say it's not a deterrent? Because we don't do it in God's way. We don't do it in God's way. won't go into that any further other than to say, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6 and 7, says this. If you want to turn to it, you can. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6 and 7. This is going to tell us a little bit about how the death penalty is to be carried out. It says, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death. Here's how. On the testimony of, of two or three witnesses. Now, it specifically says, he shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. This is why people in our criminal court system today will, uh, the prosecutors love it if they have one eyewitness, but the reality is, is that eyewitnesses, especially if there's only one, it's not very credible because you need more. God says you need two or three witnesses to verify that the person saw what they thought they saw, and they weren't the only ones who thought they saw it. But he shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. And then it even says this, the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death. That's going to cause people to think twice about whether or not they're going to testify. So, I mean, I'll be willing to testify, but you're saying that I've got to, like, participate in the execution? Well, maybe it wasn't the way I thought it was. <laughs> people might backpedal just a little bit. And then after that, the hands of the other people will go about the execution. But here's the, here's the end of it. It says, so you shall put away this evil from among you. It is a deterrent. What about the lesser crimes? What about the lesser crimes that we wouldn't think require the death penalty? Should we follow those today? I would say not necessarily. Those were a part of the civil law for ancient Israel. But the law regarding murder in Genesis 9 predates the law given to Israel, and it is for all mankind. Murder requires the death penalty. Now, why do we take that whole excursion? I want you to see how serious murder is. People got to die for that, according to God's word. And again, I know there's an avalanche of experts who say that's not right, that's barbaric, it's not a deterrent, it, da, 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 da. God says otherwise. But let's don't forget, if we're doing it the way God says to do it, it isn't done in a willy-nilly sort of a fashion. Two or three witnesses who will testify, yes, I saw this person commit this murder. And I will be a part of the first ones to participate in the execution. If we went by those standards, there wouldn't be nearly as many people convicted of murder as there are. It just wouldn't happen. The bar for the conviction is too high. 
Uh, we need to be understanding that if we do things God's way, if we were to do things God's way, things would be very different. But back to the text, Jesus' argument is that murder is serious. We already know that. We just talked about how serious it is. But he says murder is serious, and what Jesus is teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount, back in Matthew chapter 5, is that anger, which is when, which, when it is unbridled, is what leads to murder most often, is no less serious in the eyes of God than is murder. Once again, we say so many times, all sins may not be equally damaging. Before God, however, they are all equally damning. Murder versus hatred is a case in point. I'm not doing as much damage to the person or as much damage to society by hating someone, by, by having this burning anger against this person as if I killed them. We, of course not. But in the eyes of God, my anger, my burning anger and hatred before God is no less damning, even though it's far less damaging. Don't you love it when people say, well, so long as it doesn't hurt anybody, it's okay. Not according to God. It doesn't necessarily going to hurt that person for me to hate them, especially if they never know. But before God, I'm no, no less guilty than if I had taken his life. Why? Because he's in the image of God, and I have no right and no authority to have those feelings towards another human being. Jesus' point is that citizens of his kingdom, remember the Sermon on the Mount is a manifesto in the kingdom of God, citizens of his kingdom need to deal with anger as seriously as we deal with murder. We need to deal with it. I don't mean in terms of punishment, but in terms of recognizing this is serious and it's a, it's a sin. And we need to deal with it. This section includes two examples of how to understand and deal with anger. The first one is in verse 23 and 24. Look at those. We're back in Matthew chapter 5. Okay. In fact, I'm going to begin in verse 21 because I want to get the context so that we've got the flow of it. You have heard it said, heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, which again means in essence, murdering a person's uh, being and character shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So it's not only the judgment of man, but the judgment of God. And it's not only the judgment of man, or not only the judgment of God, but also of man. Therefore, verse 23, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. It's kind of interesting. He, he jumps from murder and, and all of that to how does this affect worship? You don't, uh, we dare not think we are right with God if we are not right with other people, people who are created in God's image. Because if we are not right with other people, our worship is unacceptable to God. Gee, I wonder. I wonder how many times we've come to worship God and we've been harboring anger and hatred and unforgiveness against someone else. And not that this is literal, but just to give you the idea that, that God puts his hands over his ears and says, I can't hear you. Don't come to me. Don't come to me. That's pretty serious. That really shows how serious this is. And God, don't come and tell me you love me if you hate your brother, if you hate another person who's been created in my image, even as you have been created in my image. I want you to note a couple of things about what Jesus says in verse 23 and 24. First of all, it's not just that you have a problem with your brother, but even if your brother has a problem with you, 
That's weird, huh? But it shows how much God is concerned about these interpersonal relationships and how interpersonal relationships that are not right affect our relationship with God. Verse 24, he says, be reconciled. Be reconciled. He doesn't just say let it go. He says, be reconciled. Seek rec reconciliation. In other words, it's not enough to say, well, I won't murder him. I won't murder him. Or maybe even I'll stop hating him. We must do what we can to make things right. We need to deal with the root problem, which is that unrighteous anger and hatred, not merely with the fruit of that anger, which could be murder. And again, as we've said, you can't force reconciliation, but as Romans 12, 18 says, as much as depends on you, be at peace with all men. Failure to deal with these kinds of issues, listen, adversely affects worship. Would you say it's an adverse effect on worship if God says, I don't want to hear it? Don't even bring it? Don't come and worship me until you deal with this. It's ironic when I think about the relationship between these, this anger, which in serious cases can escalate to murder, or at least spiritually it already has in the eyes of God. It's ironic that the first murder recorded in the scripture was about worship. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain killed Abel because God accepted Abel and his sacrifice, but didn't accept Cain and his, and so Cain murdered his brother. Jesus says, deal with your anger or don't come and worship me until you have. Interesting. I think if we were to, if, if people were on their, if people just on their way to worship, as he says, if you're on your way and you realize, oh, there's an issue, I wonder how empty churches would be next week as people realize, hey, you know what? I can't go worship God. I've got some real issues with my brother or my sister. I got to go take care of that and then I can worship. There's a second little section in which Jesus gives a little commentary. It's verse 25 and 26. Let me read that for you. He says, agree with your adversary quickly. You might want to circle that word. While you're on, your, uh, while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hands you over to the officer and you are thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penalty. I just want to point out one, well, actually two things here. The first is deal with your anger quickly. He says it right there. Take care of this matter. Don't just ignore it. Don't let it go. Don't let it go because if it goes, it can escalate into something else. And maybe not even murder, but legal action. It's interesting where in the first, first Corinthians we're the Apostle Paul chastises the Corinthians because they were suing each other in courts of law over matters that, as Paul says, you should have been able to work this out. You're Christians. What do you mean you couldn't work this out? Hmm. Now, this does not mean that we need only deal with relational problems if they seem like they're big enough they could end up in court. We're not saying that. It means deal with all issues, including smaller issues, before they escalate and turn into something worse, whether it be court or even if it doesn't mean going to court. Small matters left unaddressed often escalate and become big ones. Anger. You know, in this passage, Jesus isn't really talking about murder as much as he's talking about the heart that is unloving. Murder is only the example of what happens if it's let, if it's allowed to just run. We need to deal with these issues. We, we make a big mistake if we pat ourselves on the back and say, well, at least I've never killed anybody. You know, you hear people sometimes, well, I'm no sinner. I've never killed anybody. What, is that the only thing that makes a person a sinner is murder? How many insist they're not sinners and they're not deserving judgment in the eyes of God because, well, I've never killed anybody? We deceive ourselves when we whitewash our sins, insisting they're not that bad because we've never killed anybody. 
What is God, what is Christ getting at here in this section of the Sermon on the Mount? Citizens of the kingdom of heaven are as concerned about their hearts in the eyes of God as they are about their actions in the eyes of men. Well, you've heard it said, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. But I say to you, Jesus speaking, the anger, the bitterness, the hatred in your heart, way less damaging than murder, but not any less damning. Father in heaven, thank you for these words of Jesus. May we take them to heart. May we take them to heart and realize that it's not good enough for us to comfort ourselves that we've never killed anybody. Father, we pray for your blessing as we go from the here and as we think on these things. Teach us not only not to murder and not only not to hate, but to love, even as we have been loved. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Mm -hmm.